You're listening to the Devil Dog Talk Show. This show contains explicit material and is recommended for ages 18 and older for mature audiences only. But hey, it's the internet. Do you have scratchy, dry skin? Does it hurt to sit down? Are you becoming more sore on the regular? Then you've got to try Ezerin, the smoothest action around. Ezerin is not a product labeled or distributed for any FDA procedure or any regulations following any market trade or value. Side effects may include diarrhea, vomiting. Ezerin is a all-purpose suppository that can eliminate any kind of itchiness, sinus, or irritation, redness, or dryness of the bowels. Das Gunkushne ab Ethoschnan in der Uta in der Frühste Uta Kanen, wenn wir keine gute Fischte in der Ezerin. Ni hama te pa un tinto a gotik manashne Ezerin. Por su dolor de culo, y cuando tu colona no tienes rojo y arrasado, or also godar, necesitan Ezerin. Brought to you by Budweiser. Ezerin! <laughs> Excuse me, sir, do you have any Ezerin? <laughs> what up, man? What up, bro? How you doing? Pretty fucking great. Hold on, let me jump up in front of this microphone and shit, get some balance. Nice. Input thingies. Gotta love the input thingies. <laughs> what do you have like a, a setup there? Like you use a microphone and yeah. Uh, hold up. Uh, I have like um, what's it called? Uh, like a little tiny studio. It's it's pretty neat. It's like um, I got my monitors up. I got my MPC. I have uh, a nice little focus right uh, uh, interface there, and uh, that's about it, man. Mac computer. It's all you really need nowadays. Nice. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, I'm serious. Like Logic Pro X and uh, or 10 or whatever you want to call it, and then uh, you look at Pro Tools. Pro Tools is great, but when you look at also video, I think one of the greatest programs is uh, Final Cut or something like that. I think that's what it is. And also Premiere is really good, but you got to get all these extra fucking memory thingies and all this other bullshit. And I just don't want to get into video that much, honestly. I've been using a uh, Wii video. Uh-huh. What's that one? It's a cloud video system. So like you upload the videos, it stores it in the cloud. So you don't have to worry about taking up the space on your computer or anything like that. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like 25 bucks a month or something like that. It's not bad. See, I'd be more nervous, though. I, I would think that um, like it, it would be able to get hacked into or something, you know? You know, most of the cloud stuff is really secure these days. Um, you know, like between that, Google Drive, everything like that. And honestly, like the video footage I'm going to upload on there, I'm not going to put anything that I, I wouldn't want my mom to see. So. <laughs> 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 that's funny <laughs> <laughs> oh shit yeah you know i actually tried to uh, i like the iMovie um for editing like just on the quick fly on the uh for like youtube shit um it, yeah. it, work, it works really great like i, I did a oh, quick yeah. little thing for the vet together thing that we had with uh steven padilla and iva uh out at uh, mm -hmm. ucsd's uh price center and uh we gotta you know check everything out about the unknowns and shit and it was a fun time Fun time. How, uh, what was that event about? Pretty, like, movies or something like that? Or, Well, it was a documentary. Okay. Um, several guys that had previously served at the Unknowns, which is uh, the uh, crypt or tomb in um, Arlington. And uh, the thing that I can remember the most is uh just the, what that means like their sacrifice from the movie like it, not necessarily theirs not not the people that overwatch the tomb the people that are in those tombs or crypts and right. uh it was really interesting man like i i never knew that about the uh i didn't know that shit to be honest with you like when they started talking about dover and how the process goes from you know um you come in and then you die or whatever but sometimes your remains might not be a, be able to be identified nowadays yes it is but Back in the day, you know, during different wars, World War One, World War Two, Korea, those kind of conflicts, you know, we didn't have that type of stuff. So they grab a body or something, a cremate, or I don't know how the, that goes, actually. And they put it in these tombs, these three tombs. And uh, then they have the uh, uh, the guard 
um, which is like I think the third infantry. Yeah, third infantry. Uh, yeah, uh, out there in Arlington, and what they do is just you know perform these amazing, I would say, kind of rituals, but ceremonious type, uh, military type things you know like the 21 gun salutes and stuff like that yeah yeah when i used to live out there i used to go go and watch the um they have the sunset ceremony i think it's called um or is it sunrise or sun no no no, no. that's the eighth night that's the sunset that's a sunset parade but uh every hour they have a changing of the guard at the at the tombs and uh um it's really interesting to watch them i mean their drill sequences are way different than anything we did in the Marine Corps or the, or the Navy. And it really way different than anything they do in the army. Um, they have like kind of their own culture there, their own way of doing things. Um, but it's uh, the bearing they had is just amazing. And um, you know, cause you got kids trying to run up and everything like that. Um, and uh, you know, it's hot. DC is a freaking hot, awful place, man um and so they they're out there in full dress <laughs> you know just yeah they're there walking it and i'm like dude you guys are nuts like it, that was actually one of the questions is how many heat casualties uh have they seen and you know they actually had the sergeant of the guard there to kind of uh, discuss the movie the uh the, the vision of what the army's trying to accomplish uh as a whole for the that specific type of um god damn it what would you want to call that sir not not duty station i guess but i don't really know what the army calls it you know like we call it the duty station yeah like like it's a really high honor billet you know like an rdc or um you know it's really high up there where you're, you're you you are directly representing the ethos and the values of the corresponding service so like in the in the Marine Corps, if you walk around in your dress blues on the honor guard, you know every every service has honor guard. They're the shit hottest dudes in a uniform, <laughs> you know. It's like it's so pristine. And like me and my wife were talking about it. Like I used to be up people's ass about that. Like it's so easy to take care of your own shit and iron it and make it look good, but it's like that, that they take it to a whole nother level. And it was just like. Man, like I thought I was, you know, really strict about my uniform or I should say when I give a fuck, when I gave a fuck, I was really strict about my uniform. And then, you know, but the way they represent it continuously, even after their service, which I found really unique, is no matter what they do, if they get out of the service and they have a badge number, they directly still represent that specific billet in that duty station or, or that that the whole history of, you know, the unknowns. And uh, if they do anything that the army or anybody feels can be negatively uh, impacting that type of tradition, they're removed. They're actually, go, go, they go back and remove that shit. And they'll be like, nope, you're not on that board anymore. And I thought, dude, that's pretty fucking intense. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was no, like, that's crazy, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's nuts. I, I remember when I was in boot camp, they're actually selecting people for eighth and I, and, um, you had to be like six feet tall. You had to have certain body dimensions, shit like that. Like, like it was crazy. Yeah. I heard about the air. Well, not the air force, but, uh, specific role. Like if you want to be a pilot or something, or if you want to do this, you can't be this big or that tall or this short. And I didn't, right. I didn't know all that stuff when I first came in. I thought, you know, it's like whatever, you know, like you just got to do what you got to do. And then I realized that like, no, you're right. Like the majority of the honor guard, they're very tall. You know, that right. I don't, that's just the way it happens. That's the look they look for. And then even like, um, I mean, even special operators, they they don't really have a shape or su like they have a type, but not like right. a shape or a size. But I mean, well, it's funny because when I was in Okinawa, you know, you had recon there, the recon battalion and friggin' most of the guys were like little 160 pound wiry guys. Um, but they were tough as nails, you know? Oh yeah. Um, uh, we used to get in fights at the, uh, in seal club. With them. <laughs> <laughs> but Dude, that, no, but that's true. A lot of people have this expectation because of movies that somebody's supposed to look a specific way. 
funny mm-hmm. thing is, I mean, the unknowns in the way that uh, the tomb uh, guards uh, look, yes, they nail it all the time. Uh, but like what we're talking about, overall just service, like you don't know what you're going to get sometimes. And it could be, oh, the, you know, the tiniest of dude and he'll just out PT your ass. Like you, you, oh, you're, going yeah. on, you're going on a three mile run, bro. You don't want to be, you know, fucking six foot 10, 250 pounds. That's, yeah, I mean, there's dudes out there like that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be. I wouldn't want to be that shit. Fuck that. If I yeah. could be a 135 to 160 and just pure fucking like energy, dude, that'd be perfect. Yeah, most of the seals I ran into, um, we used to see them in the gym in Bahrain, and they'd be training and uh, fucking. Um, they were bigger than I thought they'd be. You know, they they all look like bodybuilders. I was like damn like how the hell do they move you know but... it's funny that's that's how that's uh it's really funny that you actually specifically say the navy seals like that i ran into a lot of dudes that you that uh, did exactly that however when they first started out and they always they told me this stuff like when i ask them questions about buds and stuff is you don't want to be massive uh right at the beginning of your career as a seal it's not gonna really it's 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 gonna it's not going to be a detriment, but it's going to be something that's not going to really help you because you don't need that extra weight, like I just got done saying. Like if you're 135, right. 160, pure fucking fire energy, and you just don't have a quit, that's what they want. You know, it's not necessarily can you mm-hmm. look a specific way at the beginning. Now, as you progress, there's even specific roles that look specific types. Like if you have a sniper dude, he looks a specific way. If you have a, a medic, he usually looks a specific way as well. And if you right. have one of those hard ass, just fucking big ass dudes, they stick out like a big old sore thumb. And they are like huge bodybuilders, some of them now, because mm-hmm. look at the job they do, which is great because I like athlete medicine and uh, special operations. They're really into that athletic medicine. Uh, which right. is good because it's not as chemical, it's not as invasive. Uh, it's more how do we optimize health? before there's injury while also preventing injury and how do we improve the way we also treat those injuries that occur because of the high rate of operation these dudes are going fucking back and forth through every which direction in the fucking world and that's every special operations group not just navy seals but since we're talking about bodybuilding and shit like that right well we're leading into that (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's really neat that the culture, it breeds a specific type of man, I would say, because you can yeah. tell the difference between uh, each branch is special dudes and also each branch is infantry. And you could also definitely tell, you know, between in, uh, mechanized infantry and, and actual grunt motherfucker, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> which is cool. They're both mechanized grunts or well, this, this side's mechanized grunts and this dude just a fucking grunt, but you get my point. Yeah. The thing about that is I always enjoyed that, like learning mm-hmm. about the diversity and in all the different branches and all the different militaries, all the different little cliques. And I don't want to say cliques because that sounds negative, but it is. It's it's a little right. community within a community. It's a little set yeah, yeah. or something, whatever you want to call it. But I loved it because when you find yourself in that community or or at least being accepted by that community, it's very invigorating. It's very picking up ness thing. and you know and i think that's what we're missing out in our in our group society as a whole as veterans and those are the groups that are usually standing up and doing something that's worth talking about nowadays like we got a a bunch of infantry dudes that are going and moving on making t-shirts and stuff or websites or uh, youtube stuff which is great all that stuff is amazing uh we have a lot of special operators that are in the media now as consultants and uh you know, media personalities. We have bodybuilders now. We have football players now. Uh, we have directors. We have all this stuff. The bad part is with certain programs that are going on right now. And I'm not. I'm not knocking anything or anybody, but it's kind of like the body. Like you know how we're gonna we're we're gonna get in a whole nutrition talk. But as far as the body goes, right? Me and you could both agree. If you don't give it the right nutrition at the right time, or if you don't put it underneath enough stress for the right duration, you're never gonna grow. It's not going to work out that right. And I just got off the uh, the old YouTube thing and uh, watched this amazing video about stress. Not not just necessarily life stress, but physical stress, like, you know, lifting weights. If you lift weights, you're putting physical stress on that muscle. 
And that muscle needs to be under that certain stress for a, p- a certain period of time. And in fact, one of the, the lifting methods that I learned when I was really into bodybuilding was time under tension. And mm-hmm. what that builds is also a really high conditioned type of strength, not just this hypertrophic type look, which a lot of dudes do have, but that's the reason why I know for a fact, when you talk about those Navy SEAL dudes or the SAS guys or anybody in those type of communities, that's the reason why I always really dreamed of working in medicine for that type of specific roles because of the science that's involved in developing the human body to its optimized self. I mean, the absolute pinnacle. And if right, you, right. It, it's something that it's, it always was my thing, man. Like when I was in the Navy and I was working at this research department for a little bit, it was my thing. Like I was like, bro, this is wow. This is fucking wow. Like every day I went to work, wow. And I loved it and I missed the <laughs> shit out of it. You know, I, I really do. And then when I got into advanced laboratory technician school, I started learning more about how the body does what it does and how we can help it go along and do what it do. But after that, I got into Al Centro. Now that, that duty station was unique. That's where I mm-hmm. actually was under time under tension for about two and a half years. And I'll tell you what, specifically stressors uh, correlating to personal development, I was able to see, address, and build off of. But if I didn't have those past experiences or those past knowledge of learning how to lift weights and correlating what I've learned, that intelligence towards other things in my life, other applications. Um, what I'm, my big point about it all is, if you look at the human body, dude, you look at the emotional phase, you look at the spiritual phase, you look at the mental phase. And that's the reason why I want, and here we're going to lead into your introduction finally, is the, the, the entire culmination, the, the cumulative look at that. As a society, we need to. I think we owe it to, you know, at least 8,000 dudes that, you know, kind of take themselves out every year in our veteran community. And I mm-hmm. actually, you know, I, I kind of blurted this out on a blog or whatever website. And it's it's disheartening to me sometimes to see that we're not necessarily correlating everything we can do or everything that we even know right now in order to help right. people. But if we were to do that, even in one day, it could take one second, it could take 30 minutes, whatever we chose to do, we could definitely fix it if we addressed those issues instead of acting like they don't exist because it might injure our pride. And, uh, you know, that's when I met you, like uh, when, we, when, we, when we met out in, uh, was it or- no, Orange County or was it Alley? Long Beach. Long Beach. Thank you. Yep. Well, yeah. We talked about spirituality and I mean, go ahead and we're going to talk about your website the blog, yeah, the man. video stuff, and also what you do for the community. Because when we met, I was like, fuck yeah, this is tight. <laughs> Holy shit, is that C.T. Fletcher? Yep. <laughs> oh, you better grow, motherfucker. And I was like, dude, all right. Um, I'm going to grow, motherfucker. All right, yeah. It was so energizing, dude. Like uh, Everybody was doing the push-up competition. Uh, there was like a real great vibe. Um, yeah, man, it was wonderful. I had a great time and this was like over a year and a half ago, I think, but yeah, yeah. however yeah, long it was, it was, it was a great event and, uh, 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 Ronin vet network. And mm-hmm. that was, another, they were in a They're the one that invited me there to actually sit down and, and start talking to everybody, which was great. Cause I never had the opportunity to sit down because of how lively everybody was. It was such a great time. Mm-hmm. No, <laughs> absolutely, man. Uh, <laughs> What was you the know, name I of that place? It, it was uh, Metroflex Gym Long Beach. I I used to be the uh, I was one of the founders of Metroflex Gym Long Beach, and um, it's it, it it doubles as one of the greatest business successes and failures I've ever had in my life because um, I started a gym that helped to create a lot of superstars in the fitness industry. Um, you know, we had CT Fletcher come out of there. We had Mike Rashid come out of there. We had a lot of IFBB pros and uh, world and national championship powerlifters come out of there. Um, we've got championship uh, obstacle course racers who can come out of there. But at the same time, when I opened it, I also opened it with no money in my pocket uh, as a minority member in the partnership. And so I was making no money, but you know, really working 18 hours a day and I was feeding myself I think at the time, I, there were days when I didn't eat, and then there were 
weeks at a time when I'd live off of like peanut butter and white bread, you know, and um, got to a point where, uh, you know, I was in a bad marriage at the time, ended up having to get divorced. And, uh, you know, I ended up uh, losing my shares of the gym and living out of my car for, for a few months. Um, and, and so, you know, being homeless kind of taught me a lot and taught me that, you know, none of us, none of us should be scared of losing everything because the reality is we have nothing to lose and everything to gain because life is so short and we'll get into that. But, uh, it was really my impetus for starting my online training business, which became successful and for starting Warrior Soul Apparel. Um, and so the other lesson there is that any bad thing that happens in your life can also be an extreme blessing. Um, in fact, every bad thing is a blessing because it teaches you something. So, and we'll get into all that. Absolutely, dude. That's what I love about it. Like, okay. So the, the website though is warriorsoulapparel.com, right? WarriorSoulFitness.com. Warrior, Warrior Soul, Soul Apparel lead there too, but WarriorSoulFitness.com. All right, good stuff. And then also, I, I really want you to kind of plug yourself as far as your your uh, your your personal training because I started it. I'm dragging my asshole, and I know it. <laughs> it it's not my fault. All right, everything's mm -hmm. so you know hard when you got kids. And I'm not I'm not trying to sugarcoat it or make excuses. It just is, you know, dealing with. Uh, I'm a hundred percent disabled veteran and I got a lot of issues, you know, that not right. necessarily that I'm a retard or a vegetable or I'm angry all the time or that I hate anybody. It's just, and you know what, Here, I'll explain it, you know, cause we are going to end up getting into a little bit of that whole spiritual development stuff, the stress. Mm -hmm. I feel like a failure to myself. And until I felt like I'm not a failure, I can't do anything. And I told my wife that, you know, it's like I, in the military, I was used to achieving shit because I knew I had to do it for my patients. I didn't give a fuck about myself. And nowadays, right. I have to give a fuck about myself because I'm the only man in the house, which is hard, dude, really hard when you have kids or a wife or a significant other or a husband, mm -hmm. whatever you are, or you could be a female looking at it the same way. It's really hard to accept that you're a good person when all you're thinking about is bad things all the time. And, uh, you know, the, I would say I've developed a lot in the previous months, uh, just recently, again, even more, but it's in spurts, which is great. I'm very facial, I'm very cyclical, and, and I'm trying to break that cycle. And that's one of the things that I very much enjoy about your program, the way that you target every facet that can actually damage somebody's motivation to achieve their personal goals, regardless of its bodybuilding, losing mm -hmm. 10 pounds, getting a little bit healthier, getting that damn cholesterol down, stop eating processed foods, a little bit more nutrition in your life. You know, that's something that I think right. is more valuable than clonopin or fucking Effexor or Percocet or crack. I mean, crack's great, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my personal training in a second. I want to focus on something you just said re really quick um, because I really do think that it's the basis of a lot of things that are going on in the veteran community right now. And that's the idea of not liking yourself very much. Um, you know, I, one of the things I've done with uh, my website, Warrior Soul Fitness, is I send surveys out. Um, I have an email list of about 1,400 veterans right now, and I, I send surveys out regularly asking them what their greatest struggle is. And, you know, I get a lot of different things, but by far, the biggest response I get is that they, they feel out of place. They're not comfortable with themselves, and they don't feel comfortable in their own skin anymore. And a lot of them have that negative imagery toward themselves where, where they don't like themselves. They, they, they're not who they want to be anymore. Exactly. And it gets back to that base point being who you want to be. Right. But the thing is in our society, we often confuse that with what we want to be. So in, and let me explain that difference. What you want to be, the, what is a label that's given to you. Right. So, for instance, in the Marine Corps, we say once a Marine, always a Marine because you earn the title. But when we think about the title, when we think about um, what it is, it's really something that's given to us. So after your service in the Marine Corps, you could 
potentially go off. You could gain weight. You could join the Communist Party. You can become a drug dealer and things like that. That's but awesome. with the title, <laughs> you would still have the title of Marine, right? Exactly. You Once a Marine, but, always a Marine. Exactly. But on the other hand, you could also um, leave the Marine Corps, join the Marine Corps League, you know, maybe get into local volunteering, helping veterans out, coaching high school teams, carry yourself in a, the same professional military manner that you did, maintain your military appearance. And in that case, not only do you have the title of Marine, but you probably also identify with being a Marine. Whereas in the previous case, you probably don't want to be a Marine anymore. You have the title, but it's not who you want to be. My point here is this, we all have the choice. We all have the choice of being who we want to be, but we get confused. We confuse that so much with the, what the identity that other people give us, the other, the identity that other people identify us by. And if more of us realized that we do have the choice to be who we want to be, and it relates to the choices, the small choices that we make every day in our lives, then we realize that almost anything's possible. We realize that we don't have to have that fear of not being significant anymore because we have the choice of being significant to ourselves, right? Because that's all that really matters. Absolutely. Do you, do you love yourself enough to be significant? Do you love yourself enough to get up earlier so that, you can get that PT session in so that you can get that extra work on your business in um, so that you can take the time to get your podcast done so that you can spend time with <laughs> yeah. your wife and children. You know what I mean? And, and that's what it comes down to. It, it, and the big word that it goes back to is discipline. Do we love ourselves enough to have the discipline necessary to lead the lives that we want to live? And I just read that book, uh, Extreme Ownership by uh, Jocko Willink and uh, Leif Babin. Mm -hmm. And I think that all veterans should read that book because there's a big thing they say in it. And it says, in discipline, there is freedom. Discipline equals freedom, right? If you don't have discipline, you're slave to whatever you want at the moment. You are slave to temporary pleasure. You're a slave to Game of Thrones. You're a slave to Xbox. You're a slave to ice cream. But if you do have discipline, you can forgo those immediate pleasures, put them off for a little bit, and then really pursue the things that are going to make you who you want to be and make you live your life to a point that you're going to enjoy it more than you ever thought you could. Dude, that is fucking awesome. Because not only is that like putting everything into words, you put everything I'm trying to explain like in my entirety into words right now. Because you're right. If you can't necessarily, this is how I feel about it. If you can't remember who you were, like that, that not necessarily that proud person or whatever it was, it's really hard to find that discipline only because you feel so angsty. And I, and I, I correlate it to being a teenager again. Because you are regressing psychologically. You're trying to figure it out once again because you've identified yourself or lost that identification once again, which is good, which is amazing because I, I, I just got done watching this video about this Jewish guy, long beard, gorgeous fucking big nose, all the good things. <laughs> <laughs> he said, life is like lobsters. Now, hold up. Don't, don't get me wrong. I love my Jews, but I didn't know that Jews were supposed to eat lobsters. I thought like shrimp and lobster was off the, off the kosher plate. But right, right. <laughs> anyways, he's talking about lobsters in the growth matter, right? Just like the stress thing that we were talking about before. Um, if you are this mushy internal soft person, right, you are just like a lobster. And I think veterans, and I don't want to correlate just the warrior class, but veterans as a whole, you know, past, present, and future are that type of person. They have a hard external shell that if mm -hmm. not understood that their internal self is a big, softy, mushy, beautiful soul, an amazing person, they can't accept the fact that maybe sometimes you need to break out of your shell and grow a little more, which is great because the way the guy broke it down is well, the way lobster does it. He goes into his little thing and breaks out of his shell and it grows a little bit more. But eventually 
the, his insights, because he's accepting so much or growing so much or eating so much, right? He reaches that ceiling within his own shell. Then mm -hmm. he sheds that shell once again and continues his growth. And I thought it was wonderful. I thought that was a beautiful metaphor, not only because I love lobster, but because yeah. it, it made sense, you know? And I, yep. it, it makes me laugh in simplicity. I always find the best answers. And it's just like math. And, and I think a lot of people have problems with math, or at least accepting that math is not just math. There's other ways of using math, like what I just said. You know, if there's this, you can feel that, but you can choose whichever which way you think about stuff in the long run, which piggybacks what you were saying is if you find that you love yourself and you're accepting of yourself, like there's a lot of people out there that I like talking about because nobody is, nobody's directly saying, Hey, have you heard of Kristen Beck? And they go, well, yeah, I've heard of her, but I don't know who that is or what that person stands for their story. And I go, mm -hmm. man, you're missing out because not only is it a great human being, what that individual as that person's choice of existence or happiness or vision of their happiness is so not accepted right now by society and the, her personal community that she has this um, negativity. And I, I don't say she does, but when people say transgender, people go, oh, mm -hmm. instead of going, what's that? You know, I, I honestly don't know the difference between transgender and transsexual. I'm an idiot and I accept that. But what I'm saying is I at least know a person that I can talk to to clarify that. But on the bigger point, it's the fact that she is so willing to accept herself and move forward with her show. I think she's still doing. She has a podcast. Uh, she's mm -hmm. running for Congress, I believe, or Senate, which which I need to really kind of double check those facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those two. I'm horrible, dude. But you know what I'm trying to say here? It hasn't impeded her growth, her shell, her development. And people need to see that, not just the life choice, but how those decisions were made. And here's the beautiful part. People aren't perfect. And that's something that right. she'll say. She'll say something I'll say. There's something that my best friends will say. My dad will say. Those are the people that I find, that's something probably you would say, that I really get along with, regardless of what their personal lifestyles are that make them happy. You know, it's, it's a beautiful uh, acceptance phase that could occur as long as we kind of face those things that we're not necessarily comfortable with. And it's not right. bad being uncomfortable. Like in the military, we understood that. Like when you stood on those yellow fucking footprints, how mm -hmm. uncomfortable were you? Oh, pretty damn uncomfortable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. remember being butt naked in a room full of people and a room yep. full of girls. And I'm going but, like, hold up. I got about a one inch dick right now. This is not me, bro. <laughs> this, it is cold. It's, I'm, we just got done swimming. No, you didn't. Huh. All right. Stop it. But, but here's the thing. And, and, and just going back to that night, um, from what I remember from standing on the yellow footprints, the scariest thing about it was stepping into the unknown, you know, standing on yellow footprints, you know, if we had to do it in the context that we're in right now, yellow footprints popped up in my living room right now. And I had to stand on them. That's not going to be scary. I would trip because, out. Because I know, well, yeah. yeah. I'd be like, holy <laughs> fuck, this is great if, weed. <laughs> oh, if they oh. just appeared. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is, is the <laughs> context of the unknown, not, not knowing what's going to happen next, that's what makes you so uncomfortable during that first night at boot camp. And then they keep you up all night. You have to do this kind of awkward call to your parents, um, it's saying, you know, I've like arrived. Been kidnapped. At... <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And I, I've uh, arrived at my destination. I am okay and healthy. <laughs> yep, yep. And exactly, exactly. But um, but I think that's the the same thing with the civilian world. Uh, when you're stepping out into the civilian world and, and when you think about what happens in boot camp, you get influenced so much, you get, you get influenced so much by your drill instructors. If you're in the Marine Corps or your drill sergeants, if you're in the army um, and, and uh, they become these kind of larger than life figures in your life. And that keeps going throughout your time in the military. You, you gain mentors, you know, you, your NCOs, um, your officers, you have people around you who are generally, genuinely trying to shape you and shape you in a positive light, but then you get out and 
you know, you don't, you don't necessarily have anyone around you. Not many people are paying that much attention to you, but then you turn on the TV and you see on the news media that, you know, PTSD is affecting veterans. Um, depression is affecting veterans on a massive scale. And you know that from your experience, you have these kinds of awkward feelings and you might have depression and you might have a bit of PTSD, but the media is telling you that it's a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And so you start to adapt to that kind of identity where some of the feelings you're feeling, which are normal if you've been on, in combat, like, you know, being a little bit hyper vigilant or being a little bit uncomfortable in public situations, but the media you know, they, they tell you it in a certain way and all of a sudden it makes you feel a hundred times more abnormal than you did. I would say even victimized because of even the victimized. Yeah. Yes, because exactly of the, because of the tone, you know, and I have nothing against media. I love every kind of, I love being entertained. I'm a, like I said, a vegetable pretty much, you know, and vegetables like things that are all around them. They just sit there and watch it. But like, I love the media, but you know what? They're not doing a great job of what we could be doing. And that's, that's actually, it's priceless that you're saying it because if you feel shamed into a victimized role, you're going to exist in that role for the rest of your life. And I don't want to correlate that to any other thing like race or gender or anything else. I want to make it so that's everything in life. That's what life kind of is in its fucked up way, but also in a good way. Right. My point is this, and, and you hit the nail on the head with the victimization. So, right, we have these feelings, but who the hell is to tell somebody that these feelings are not normal? Who the hell is to tell somebody that they're abnormal for feeling what they're feeling? And, right, your life might not be like your friend from high school who went to college, got out, got married, got a job as an insurance salesman, um, and you know, lives in a, lives in a house with his two kids and his dog, but who's to hell, who the hell is to say that he's normal, right? Who knows what skeletons he has in his closet, who knows what he thinks about before he goes to bed and nobody does because nobody's focusing on him like that. And we're getting, the problem is veterans are getting the wrong kind of focus Absolutely. rather than being focused on as people who are fully capable and fully able to run businesses, to be leaders, because we have the training, mm -hmm. we have the ability, we've proven it. We're being focused on as a victim class and it's changing some people's psychology. I don't wanna say it's changing everybody's psychology, but it seems that it's changing some people's psychology. I would say and it's impacting everyone, everyone's psychology. I mean, on a global, earthal, terrestrial scale. Now, as a class though, yeah, I agree that there's specific ones that take it a little too hard. And those mm -hmm. are the ones that, again, I honestly do believe that because of the media, not just outlash or outcry, that isn't actually focused on any kind of solution. If you are in exactly the specific suicide classification right now, or the highest percentage, I should say, of the categorized uh, geographic, like the Vietnam era dudes right now, they're the majority of what's happening. The 45 to 65 range are the mm -hmm. majority that are killing themselves. Could you imagine, and I could, I can imagine, if I felt like I was being a detriment or some added weight to a, a system and somebody kept blaming me because I was added weight to a system and a young dude or a young family or something young or something that I cared about died because I am dragging down the system. Dude, that's a very, 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 very realistic outcome to come to because you're going, Absolutely. I don't have anything more to serve. I've had a pretty damn good life. Uh, da, 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 da. You start rationalizing those type of decisions because they're kind of accepted and tolerated, but also I, I want to say encouraged by society right now because right. of the natural way men, and I don't mean just men, men that fight and also women that fight, their mentalities will derive that type of conclusion from that type of situation. So again, like math, if, you're, if, if somebody says we're here to help you, you show up. And they say, fill out all this paperwork. You fill out all the paperwork. You sit there for hours on end. 
You don't know mm-hmm. what's going to happen. You're nervous. You're scared. You're in the uncomfortable state. They say, we can't help you right now. Okay, so you go away. You did all that paperwork for what? You try to get help for what? And those are the type of questions those people have to go home to every single day. They either call, you know, specific resources like the VA or or sometimes things that aren't following through because the VA is a great place. Okay. Right. We, we, it's just like the United States of America. Okay. I think of it that way because it's the largest medical system in America, but it's also the largest government entity in America that nobody really validates, which is great. But, you know, hey, let's focus on it. If the VA was all this bad stuff, right? then how is it even possible that we've gotten this far? Somebody would have stopped it by now. Am I saying that everything is perfect? Fuck no. Just like in the military, nothing's perfect. We already know that. You have to Semper Gumby shit all the fucking time. But when you're in a VA situation, you're in a desperate moment, a crisis situation, you're not going to be very flexible, especially if all your red flags are up as a PTSD dude. You know what I mean? And I don't mean that PTSD is this negative fucking thing because we utilize that same instincts, those same things to stay alive in combat, which is engraved into our soul, into our reptilian fucking brain. Our amygdala Mm -hmm. is transfixed on what we've learned because we know you could live or die. That's it. It's simple. It's so stupid Mm -hmm. that it's simple, but it's that simple. We're stupid fucking animals. We have lizard brains. If somebody says... Hey, eat that sugar cube because it feels great and it tastes wonderful. You're going to be like, oh yeah, dude, it's the crack. It's literal crack for your brain. Mm -hmm. Sugar is crack for your brain. I love sugar and I know it's crack for my brain. But if you teach children that it's okay to eat sugar all the time, we become crackheads. Clearly. Right. Right. (laughs) I mean, clearly. Exactly. Exactly. And and just to give you some some back and again i i think there's a lot of really hard working people at the va but i also think that if anything with what's going on between the media and the pressure on the va to respond to the situation with ptsd it is creating a bit of an over response in some cases now let me explain something to you my service in the marine corps i never really did a lot of high speed shit. I served in Iraq, but my tour in Iraq was in Southern Iraq running security missions. Now, parts of that were scary because, you know, we did operate a bit far away from any kind of support, but the closest thing I ever had to death was when a flying fish hit me in the face. Like (laughs) I, I was never really freaking traumatized or anything like that. Now I come home and, uh, you know, I, I, I actually resisted going to the VA for a long time, uh, until I got ulcerative colitis and, and ended up going. Um, but, uh, I, I filled out, you know, the entry surveys that they have there. And so I filled these surveys out and, you know, I'm looking at the questions, you know, do you, do you feel uncomfortable in public, public spaces, you know, and I'm kind of an introvert. So yeah, I feel uncomfortable in, in, in public spaces. Do you tend to get angry easily? Um, you know, in, in certain situations, I can't remember specifically what the questions were, but I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't like idiots. They, they suck. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so I fill out these questions and they're looking at it and then, um, you know, cause I had to get a primary care so they put me in outpatient psych for treatment for PTSD. And I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm like, you know, did you read my service record? And they're like, yes, and, you know, but you have all the signs of PTSD. And I'm like, dude, the, it, it's impossible that that service connected. You know, my memories of the Marine Corps are, I mean, the Marine Corps did absolutely amazing things for me. Um, there was the big green weenie. I did get slapped in the face and hit on the ass with it a bunch of times, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but there was no real trauma from my service in the Marine Corps, aside from living in Okinawa for a while. Um, and, uh, and that's the thing. Like, I think that in a lot of these cases where they hand down these diagnoses, it starts to make the person feel abnormal. Because after that, I'm like, well, if I tested, if they think I have PTSD, maybe there's something wrong with me. Yes, and you start and self then, destruction or self self right. questioning, like to the and the, so the what if factor. Okay, that's something right. I wrote last night that I can't wait to talk about. The what if factor of life 
terrifies people in, in, in just any existence that's existed in life. If you continually say what if to yourself, to your identity, to what you love, to what you feel, or in a negative way, and I, and I mean that specifically because there is what if in a good way, and we know the difference now only because of how much different bad experiences and good experiences and good lessons, bad lessons, mistakes, failures, and successes because we didn't stop. We didn't give up. We kept going. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's the thing, I think, with this, this kind of negative imagery. You know, after that, I lost my filter. You know, I, I started – when I was angry at somebody – everybody knew about it, you know? And then you start to look at yourself and you're, you're like, wow, this is really affecting me. Um, but what about that kid who actually has PTSD? What about that, that, that kid who's actually experiencing everything? And when they listen to all of this stuff, what does that do to them when they're trying to go out on a date with a girl or start a relationship? Or even make a phone call to their family or write a letter. Like that, right. that's something I just overcame yesterday. And I don't know if that's the right way to pretense that, but I overcome it. I whatever you want to say. Okay, I was finally able to sit down and talk to my dad again, and I don't mean mm-hmm. that in a bad way. I mean that in the best of ways because I was able to go to my Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, my God, mm-hmm. in prayer and say, you know what? I don't know what the fuck to do. I know I want to fix this shit. I I'm lost. Like what's up? And all of a sudden, I had an idea. With the simplest fucking idea, like I said, what if I just write and send them a message on Facebook? Like, I mean, what if I just try that? You know, instead of saying, what if he's mad? Or what if I'm mad? Or what if I'm hurt? What if he's hurt? Blah, blah. You could sit there all day trying to figure it out. In fact, you could sit there your entire life. And you'll miss out on the beautiful things we could be sharing. And then finally, I just said, fuck it. What if it works out? You know? What if? Yeah. It's just, here's the funniest thing. And in that moment... I remembered why, and and uh, uh, my wife's gonna kill me. I was really great, not necessarily sexual. Uh, yes, okay, I was great with women in every which way you can imagine, but it was only because I had that confidence in that what if outcome being positive. Mm-hmm. Like I, I remember vividly, and this is kind of like a really re- misdirection rewrite, and whatever we were going on that positive stuff. But it's a good positive funny. I remember asking a girl, you know, at, in a group, and. Uh, it was a great night. Ended up being wonderful. Uh, I walked up to her. I actually learned this from one of my dudes. He taught me when I was going through lab tech school. You just walk up to a gorgeous female that's being surrounded by the majority of dudes trying to hit on her. And everybody that's been to a club knows and sees that. Uh, and you just say, hey, I'd really like to know how you taste and walk away. <laughs> and it worked. I didn't know why. And the funniest thing is we ended up just kind of laughing it off. And that's usually what fucking works with girls. And that's where I'm good is just making people laugh. And so like, I'm sitting there laughing, we're all laughing. And that's kind of like when I remember just yesterday, I was good a a long time ago. I was good back in the day when I was able to not care about the negative outcome, but I was focused on the positive what if. And in that dating realm as a guy, you have to build that confidence as a man, and even as a woman, you have to build that what if positive outcome in your life because even it's great that we're talking about relationships, but even in school, even in work, even in, in your car, even in your dog, what if I taught my dog to not be an asshole? What if I, taught, you know, those are all the good things you could be saying what if to, and it's really hard to focus when every single media source, um, is kind of painting that victimized role. Like, this is what you are. This is what we see. So that's what you are. And I agree with the black community in that that's a lot of what they're also trying to kind of deflect and explain is the perception that everybody knows, everybody has a perception that they feel is X, Y, and Z. It may not actually be X, Y, and Z, or it actually could be X, Y, and Z. And that's where we're actually at. We're debating whether or not it's happening or not. But as a community, we should say, if it's in discussion, it's happening. Regardless of the amount that one side is saying to the other, it's happening because they're talking about it. So if we were to come together instead of just talk about one side, whether or not it's happening or not, and go, how is it happening? Let's discuss that. How can we actually change this? How is it going to negatively impact the entire system we've developed? How is it going to positively impact the entire system we've developed? 
And that's really important as the United States of America to do. And Congress is making big failures on that. They don't want to agree. They don't want to work. They don't want to talk. They just want to be Republican or Democrat, which is horrible because we're all right. Americans. And once we sit down and agree on that one thing, which has always been the one thing, like ever since George Washington and everything else, when all this fucking shit started, everybody stood up and said, the king's kind of dipping his dick in us a little too much, bro. Like, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I love our fucking life and I love this situation. But some asshole said this. He goes, but I don't want to pay 1% tax. What? 1% tax. Oh, my God. Could you imagine a 1% tax nowadays? Mm -hmm. People would fucking flip their shit with all the money they had. So right. think about that. That dude said 1% tax. Uh -uh. We're going to write this fucking king right here, this dude, a letter. Okay? And that happened, like, I think October 24th, October 25th, 1774. They sent king dude can't remember his name. Hey guys, look, we love you. We really like what you're doing. Uh, we kind of disagree with the tax. Can we work on that? The king answered back, fuck you. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, and it escalates from there. Okay. You see, you can see how that happened. And that was a revolutionary war, but it wasn't just a revolutionary war. It was a miscommunication and a, a lack of will to Semper Gumby for the common good, for the greater good of an entire society. Because we still, we have great commu communication now with Great Britain. We have wonderful, wonderful communication with them. In fact, we have wonderful communication with just about every single thing out there, even the bad guys, because we're trying to work on it. But we're not as a society trying to work on anything that's not directly related to our personal lives, which is hard because you're trying, it's like trying to inject something that nobody wants to watch. It's like saying, Hey, watch this horrible show. Oh yeah, no, here we go. It's like watching the old sex ed videos and still trying to think that you can <laughs> date Miss Susie and itch and crotch over there on the left. You're, you're not, it's not, you're just gonna be like, Oh shit. Maybe that's why her vagina is always itchy is because she has chlamydia. <laughs> Thank you. School. Fuck that. I'm gone. <laughs> the, the big thing, Joey, is this. I in, in I love I love everything you're saying. Um, I really, I'm I'm a really big realist when it comes to government, and I don't believe that the United States government or that the Veterans Administration is going to come up with an answer to this problem. Um, I really don't. I think that the only way we're going to come up with a viable solution to everything that's going on with veterans right now is through self-empowerment and through making ourselves better people. Absolutely. And realizing that we do have something to bring to the table, realizing that at one point in our lives, we were high performance people. We were the best amongst high performance people. Even if you've never served in combat and you just have the training that you've had and you've had experience managing other people as a 22 year old getting out of the military after you've served four years, then you have more experience in management than 75 to 80% of your peers in that age group. I would say a hundred percent more because learning something that, you know, from school and college, not, not to, not to separate the two because learning is a part of college, but that's not the only place learning occurs. And well, I'm, I'm I'm speaking about people who um, may have had jobs, may have you know started their own companies at 18 years old, that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. But uh, but what I'm saying is that you know, as people coming out of the military, you have so much more experience just leading. Mm -hmm. And the the real tragedy in what has been going on with the media is that a lot of these guys don't feel like they have anything to bring to the table anymore because they feel like they've had their, what they are taken away, but they've forgotten who they are. And, you know, take the example of dating a girl again, you know, or trying to start a relationship or start meaningful relationships. If you feel like you have nothing to bring to the table, you're going to be more hesitant to talk to people. You're going to be more hesitant to start new relationships. You're going to be more hesitant to talk to that girl you like, or that guy you like. Um, and, and so the, the big movement I want to see, I want to see veterans taking care of themselves. I want to see veterans, you know, doing things like 
reading business books, reading books on leadership. I want to see veterans doing things like mentoring each other um, and helping each other to start businesses. And I know that's going on in a very low level right now, but I think that if we made it into more of a social movement, um, you know, I wrote an article called saying that veterans are the new hippies. I love that article, are. by the way. We are. We are the new counterculture. And and there's power in that because, because we're the guys on the sidelines. We can do, do and say almost anything we want to. And it's going to be looked at a little bit weirdly, but that's how it gets noticed. Oh, yeah. If we, if we start coming out and, and saying, you know what? We know how to run this country. We know, um, we know how to lead people. And we're better than what you think we are. Then I think people are going to start to listen. And it, it comes down to that kind of consciousness. You nail it right on the head. And it's beautiful because as a big picture, that is what needs to happen. And uh, one of the best things that I read recently is self-care. Okay, knowing what good self care is, and you learn that in the military day one in boot camp because you're trying to succeed, you're trying to develop and grow, you're trying to learn. You're de- you know you're an idiot because somebody just told you you're a fucking idiot, so you're pretty sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. So at least you know one thing for sure: it's gonna suck, and you're a fucking idiot. Because yeah, let me tell you what I was up until the day I got out of the Navy, a fucking idiot. Always, because I knew without that mentality, I'm never going to learn something. I'm going to think I'm right. I'm going to be stubborn. I'm going to be X, Y, and Z. And I don't want to be X, Y, and Z. I want to be A, C, A, B, C, D, or A, C, D, C, whatever you want to call it. (laughs) I want to be me, even within that type of thing. So instead of getting pride or building something off of nothing, I just called myself a fucking idiot. And it ended up making me pretty good at what my job was, being a corpsman, because in every single scenario, if you don't humble yourself, you're going to overlook the thing that could save a life. Absolutely. And it's hard, dude. It's really hard to even say that, you know, and go, but even emotionally as people, we can do the exact same thing. But Corman, again, that consciousness, and uh, I'd say just medics, go medics, go doctors, go anything with the caduceus, right? Go anywhere with that. And I love Dan Winters. Uh, Dan Winters, a uh, great, great metaphysics professor, dude, guy, amazing stuff. I don't even know his title. I just know that when I when he talks about the Kundalini and the Caduceus and all this other stuff and this con- internal connection to want to share and the bliss and all this other great stuff, I can't help but say that most definitely medics, corpsmen, doctors, the ones that are good, exemplify that type of characteristics where you're going, I have to do whatever I need to do to provide, uh, to save a life or to improve health. And that's not what we're trying to do on an overall scale in medicine right now. And I just got done writing about this, but it was one of those things that it really moved me to kind of realize it's as simple as discussing it just as much as we are right now and stepping away and going, what is, what are, all the inputs that we can evaluate right now, how can we simplify them? How can we simplify the types of problems we're having? Are they correlatable? Are they relatable? Are they compartmentalizable? Are they workable? What type of problems do we have? Nobody's focusing on growth. They're focusing on saving themselves because we feel as if we can't kind of let go and be our old selves because of how much we've either been hurt or taken advantage of, which is valid in any scenario where depression, PTSD, and TBI, all that stuff come from where you're isolated. You don't want to go to places. You don't want to try anymore. That's where that comes from. But that's right. also where we can learn on how to stop that, which is amazing. Right, right, exactly. And it, it, it goes back to knowing yourself uh, or getting to know yourself because in a lot of ways, we spend so much of our time trying to understand the world around us we forget to try and understand ourselves we forget to under try to understand the thoughts and the feelings underlying all of our actions um and i think a really good starting point for people in trying to start a new life is to take a piece of paper and to write down 10 words that they use to describe everything that they want to be as a person 
and then narrow those 10 words down to five and then make those five words your core values. And those core values should drive every single thing you do, your goals, your actions on a daily basis. You should keep them in a place where you can look at them all the time. And I think it's really important for veterans to do that because we're familiar with that. You know, each of the services has their own core values and those core values drive your professionalism. They drive the way you conduct yourself and they just, they drive your decision-making in all situations. Um, and it's just a really good way to manage yourself that I think all veterans can be familiar with. No, you're absolutely right. And that's, I think the simple answer that we don't want to kind of look at, you know, and it's not that we don't want to, it's that we're overlooking the simplicity in that by overestimating how much work it actually is going to take to accept that path. Because like, like we said at the beginning, it's just like stepping on those yellow fucking footprints. Once you fucking step on them, bro, it's already almost over because the ride's going to fucking go by quick. Yep. You don't know yep. that because at the time you're getting called fucking idiot. You're getting called all this wonderful names. You're learning so much in the, the diverse range of vocabulary in the Marine Corps. But also I, I learned that in the Navy because I got to hang out with a lot of Marines. They're great people. I love them. They keep shit real and simple <laughs> because they know, hey, this is the fucking shit that works, bro. We don't make a lot of money. We don't get funded. Um, <laughs> and guess what? What? You're going to tag along, doc. Ha <laughs> ha, motherfucker. <laughs> so guess what? Um, you're going to learn quick or you're going to fucking sink. You either sink or swim. And that's what I love about certain communities because they know that they try to be compassionate as possible. You can't be in certain per uh, certain circumstances. It doesn't mean that you're not compassionate. It simply means, hey, at the mission right now, the task at hand, is it imperative to be emotional? Usually not. Not at all. In fact, the last thing you want to do is feel shit when shit is going down. Like, oh, hey, this person's bleeding out. And I also grew up with him in the military. That's not good. You don't want to think about yeah. that right then and there. You want to focus on, all right, this person's leg is leaking. How do I stop that? <laughs> let's, right, right. Let, let's go with that one first. All right, what else do I need to do? Oh, I need to look around and make sure that that's the only thing that's wrong with them. All right. So it's now a car. And that's what I did a lot of the times because I grew up in trucking. I grew up where mechanics and, and everything was a, a basic knowledge around my family. So I was really able to correlate that where if a person's leaking out either way, emotionally, physically bleeding, because like we were discussing, like you said, it, you, you got anger outbursts just as much as I do. And I still do. And what I say is because you can't put that filter back on. That's telling me you have a injury that's causing leakage. That we need to figure out how to stop it. Not stop the leakage. Not saying you're not right for leaking because it's not your fault. I can't blame the dude for bleeding because he got shot in his leg, right? So I can't blame the guy that's depressed or sad or wants to kill himself because that's the only thing he feels. It's the same thing that this motherfucker feels. Trust me. He only feels his leg. I promise you that. <laughs> I promise you that. His dog could have just got fucking ran over. He got shot in the femur. He's fucking paying attention to that. <laughs> right right exactly and the worst part is we know how to fix those things but we don't know how to correlate the same type of intelligence that we learned to stop hemorrhagic anything you know from somebody bleeding out we've learned how to do that you provide compression right well i love another c word for this it's called compassion very easy simple see right now definitely true i also think that in a lot of ways, before we can help anyone else, we really have to try to help ourselves to be the best person possible. You have to, you have to learn to manage yourself first. And again, that goes back to knowing and understanding who you are, because once you know and understand who you are and know how to manage yourself and know how to navigate yourself, you gain a lot of insight. And you can gain a lot of insight into other people's psychology and as to what they're thinking. Um, and it allows you to relate to people on such a different level because you're able to pull yourself back from your own situation and really start to see things from their perspective. Um, and I think that 
that's something else that's lacking is that we forget to put ourselves into other people's shoes. Um, we, uh, we look at everything from our own kind of eyeglass and we're the stars of our own movie, but we forget to realize that there is no movie going on. We're a fart in the wind in the universe. <laughs> and the universe is a massive thing that will go on with or without us. And because of that, yeah, that's a really humbling thing. You know, we're, we're pretty small and insignificant. And, you know, you feel that when you're um, uh, in the military a lot of times because you realize how insignificant you are. But that's also freeing. Oh, it's yeah. also very liberating because you realize that if I fuck up, out here in the civilian world, there's really nothing to fear. You know, people, people aren't losing lives and limbs, mm -hmm. you know, all that's going to happen is maybe my pride gets bruised a little bit. Maybe my ego gets bruised a little bit, but the big benefit there is that you're also going to learn something. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn how to make a mistake. You're going to learn how to take a risk because you're going to realize that the world's not going to come, come to an end because you took that risk and screwed up. And you're going to learn lessons from the mistakes that you made. And that's going to give you the confidence to go forward with clenched fists and take on the next problem. So. Excited with motivation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, that, and that's the thing, dude. You nailed it. You nailed it right there. Yeah, man. And just to take things back to fitness, because I, I know that's uh, one of the reasons why you wanted me to have, wanted to have me on is, um, I think that in a lot of ways, the way that veterans health is being managed right now is that kind of process that you mentioned earlier, where, you know, we fill out a bunch of paperwork, we're waiting for hours on end at the VA and, you know, we're really waiting for a doctor's opinion to give us something, whether it's his opinion on our disease, whether it's, it um, validates the situation. Right. Because Whether you respect that authority. That's about exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, to some extent, you know, we're waiting for the verdict on our, our disability rating and all, all these other factors. But at the same time, in putting so much of that into someone else's hands, um, it takes the control of the situation out of your own hands. And whenever you give up control like that to that extent, there's going to be a degree to which you feel helpless and there's going to be a degree to which you feel like you don't have control over some of the most vital aspects of your life. And in my opinion, that's where fitness comes in. Fitness is gaining control over your faculties and working up reservoirs um, or not reservoirs, working up moats, digging moats around your own physicality to prevent your own loss of control of the situation. So for example, you know, when you're 20, you don't have to worry about many external factors attacking your body if you're not in combat, right? Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to be my age at 37, you know, other things start to creep in, you know, achy joints, um, the prospect of the fact that my grandfather was a year younger than me when he had his first heart attack. Um, you know, starting to worry about things like colon cancer, starting to worry about things like uh, the fact that you put on weight a little bit easier. Um, and all these things start to creep in and, you know, those those moats get filled in with sand and the, the external invaders begin to have a much easier time of attacking you. But if you're consistently digging moats, if you're seeing to your own nutrition, if you're taking care of your gut health, if you're taking care of your brain, and if you are um, conditioning yourself to the point where your body's not going to fall apart or you're not going to slip a disc when you bend over to, to tie your shoes, then you gain a much greater sense of control over your be being and over your existence here on earth because you have so much re less reliance on other people to tell you your state of being or your state of health. Damn, bro. That's awesome. Like the, right. the, like the whole time, the only, the only thing I could think about, okay, not, not to discredit all those wonderful words, but my active reaction, I kind of went back to Long Beach where CT was like, grow, motherfucker. 
I feel that way. Like <laughs> spiritually, that's what we're saying in order to kind of, you know, pick up your ball sack and get back in the gym sometimes or your ovarian sack, whatever, which one you got right. uh, to get in there and do whatever it takes. But also emotionally, uh, spiritually, mentally, physically, psychologically, relationshiply, whatever we want to lily, we could do that. But not until we feel confident enough to accept it or command ourselves to grow, like how CT says it bluntly. Because it's what all those things you say you worry about, he's experienced some of them. And I know that for a fact. Like I remember one of his his big things that he talked about when we were there was the the heart thing, the heart surgery or whatever it was. Right. And, and just for the, the listener's knowledge, I I was CT Fletcher's nutrition coach for a while. I was Mike Mike Rashid's nutrition coach for a while. And um you know, CT Fletcher came into the gym. He walked off the street. He was, he was dirt poor at the time. And, uh, I helped him get ready for his first, uh, natural world championship bodybuilding show, uh, which he won. And he got nice. his, uh, WNBF pro card. But nice. the thing about CT is when you look at him and his history, a lot of his issues now with his health were met with choices and trade-offs that he made in his youth. He wanted to be the biggest, strongest motherfucker on the planet. And so he would eat five to six cheap McDonald's cheeseburgers a day. He would eat, um, he would drink four to six chocolate, chocolate or strawberry shakes a day. Um, you know, he'd have four or five McDonald's apple pies a day. And the reason why he did that was because he thought that it was going to contribute to his strength. But what was lacking there was his personal research and the humility that it takes to understand how these things are going to affect your body in the long run. And this is where humility builds strength because that man who had a world record bench press was one of the strongest men on earth was worn down and destroyed for a while because he tried to defy nature. And one of the big misconceptions about nature is that mother nature is some fairy that goes around with wings and brings life to everything. Mother nature is actually a bitch that looks like the grim reaper. <laughs> and if you try to defy her, she will, if you haven't already replicated yourself and, and had children, she'll, she'll kill you and eradicate your genes from this earth. And that's the way mother nature works. You have to adapt. You have to become strong. You have to learn from the earth. You have to learn from the environment around you. You have to learn from the people who have been where you want to go or you will face mother nature's wrath. Absolutely. See, and that's something where, where again, it, it still goes into that spiritual realm, but it's it's not. I don't like people saying just because you're spirit, oh, you're a God freak or a Jesus freak or all this other stuff because it has no grounding. Like right now, the whole scientific push is that science and religion have no place together, and I'm like, come on, guys. I mean, we're not gonna just fucking argue about stupid shit nowadays, are we? Because um, the only reason why science is here is because of religion. Here's a fun fact. The only reason why religion's here is because of science. Here's a funner fact. People back in the day, way back in the day, clearly had a fucking clue about how to do shit that we can't even figure out right now. But why? It's because they were focused on what? But if we can't ever derive to those conclusions, if we can't ever fixate our mentality on a solution, that positive what if, like for CT, right? That positive what if was, what if I talk to Chris and what if I get healthy with through nutrition? And what if I command that shit to grow? You know, it's like, it's all of it. You know, he, he had that, that personality that kind of gets you up and fucking wants to lift a weight. And I loved it. But then I was like, but Chris is the fucking brain. And I could, I know it. I just, I don't know why. I just, I'm good at that. But I'm like, dude, um, I know my thing has always been nutrition, trying to put in the right fuel at the right time with the right resources after the right type of stressor is what growth is. It's both spiritually, mentality, me mentally, 
psychologically, either which way you want to put that. Spiritually, I already said that one. And physically, through muscles and shit, like we said, time under tension. And to kind of wrap it all up into a beautiful saying is, if you're not trying to get uncomfortable, or not, I'm not saying unbearably com- uncomfortable. The only thing you should be unbearably uncomfortable with in your life is how happy you are. You should be like, oh no, I am really uncomfortable about how happy I am right now. That's good. That's the good uncomfortability. Also is I'm uncomfortable with this decision because I think that it will stop thinking and start doing something because that's exactly what boot camp was. And that's what life actually is because that's the same thing that, you know, stop. We'll go back to it. CT's cycle of not optimization, right? And that's where I love going full circle on these conversations. Right. We look for optimization. Well, that's the thing too, is you mentioned something there about being uncomfortable. Everybody says that they're scared, they're scared of failure. People or people say that, um, like success coaches, there's a lot of success, success coaches that says that people don't take risks because they're scared of failure. That's bullshit. People, people aren't scared of failure. You know why? Because failure again, doesn't look like the grim reaper. Failure looks like your couch. Mm -hmm. Failure looks like your Xbox. Failure looks like that fucking car you're going to buy that you can't afford. That's what failure looks like. People love failure. They're, they're attracted to it like a moth to a light bulb. It's like the sugar. It's crap. Right. It's crap. It's the, <laughs> it's the road to success that people are scared of. It's that fucking discomfort. The fact that I got to get up and work, work out every day. And to bring this back to the spiritual, right? When you think about all major religions, there's, there's a factor there. And that's the human factor. If you think specifically about Christianity, but you could be an Odinist, you could be a Muslim, you could be a Jew, and this will hold true. The human factor, free will, right? That was the one, that's the one thing that in any religion, they believe that God can't control, especially in Christianity, right? Because if you give your love to Christ, for example, in Christianity, you do it of free will. And that's the basis of anything. The same thing applies to your life. It goes back to that word discipline. Discipline is making the choice to be a better person of your own free will. Making the choice to put off all those little creature comforts so that you can be more successful and have a better life in the long term. Free will. And as I said before, as Jocko Willink says, discipline equals freedom. That is fucking awesome, dude. I couldn't even agree with you more, man. Like, I absolutely agree. Uh, 110,000%. I don't even care if that's not a reality. <laughs> <laughs> but I do because I, I wrote a really great paper, uh, paper, article, whatever you want to call it, on... Uh, well, it was, it was several sections, okay? I, I called it medicinal versus recreational. But the actual objective of the paper was to make people question anything that they're not trying to question right now. And the main focus was, of course, on cannabis, but not necessarily in the context of what anybody would think about. Because when I talk about freedom in that paper, I talk about the mentality of freedom. And the mentality of freedom is the only actual freedom in this existence. If you do not feel or think or believe to be free, my friend, you're not. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you do. You will be so self-destructive because you are not feeling or thinking as if you were free. And that I see a lot in the world and it terrifies me because it's a simple solution. Believe in yourself more than the thing you're looking at because sometimes you can't necessarily see it. And until we put on the right filter, just like, you know, for all my lab techs out there in microbiology, if you don't put the right lens or the right shade of light or this or fucking, you're not going to see shit. Okay. You're not, it's going to be so annoying. You're going to fucking get angry. You're going to throw your $3,000 microscope with the fucking camera attached across the room. And you're going to be like, fuck this. <laughs> I don't need this shit in my life. And that's how it feels. That's real life. That's everything. We're, we feel like as if, if we don't get it right, we're failures. And that's not right. What you said is truth. When we accept a limit and when we accept a, 
confirmation of what we don't want simply because it's not necessarily socially accepted, that's when we start to die. And that's one thing that like a Dan Winter really points out in his his whole discussions on fractalfield.com. It's where you can do literally anything in the cosmos, not just here on earth, in every single dynamic of which energy exists, that's where we exist. And we as in a spirit, and I don't mean that lightly because we've done research on DMT, we've done research on psilocybin, we've done research on LSD, we've done research on the majority of psychedelics, and we've done research religion, we've done research in science. Now it's time as a society to make the big picture kind of intertwine and connect. Because if we're trying to make a basket to catch everybody, right? That's what society really sounds like they want. They don't want everybody to fail. They want a safety net. I'm going, the safety net is in believing in yourself because that's the only fucking thing you have. (laughs) And I don't mean it badly. I don't mean it in a bad way. I'm not saying you're all alone in the world. I'm saying nobody sees it the way you see it. And if you don't speak up, we don't understand because we don't talk in telekinesis anyways anymore or at all, whatever you want to say, you know, psychologically, there's no nonverbal or non-physical communication. Communication is just that it's 10% verbal. And that means that it's 10% the words you say. And then it's all the 90% is how you're saying it, when you're saying it, uh, your tone of voice, um, your expressions, the words you choose, uh, your facial expressions, your body position. And you learn that in the military, because if you don't, that person could have a weapon to blow you up. If it, right. if, if you're not paying attention to those small micro expressions where you're like, oh, bad situation. You're, you're, mm-hmm. It's never a good situation, clearly. But nowadays, trying to teach people in society that the veteran community is not just saying, hey, bad situation. And uh-huh. for no reason, because with the victimized mentality, and I, lo- I want to I correlate it. It's like having a female claim rape when she didn't get raped. Okay. Right. We didn't get raped. Okay. We, we fought a war for a country that went to war. End of the story, new beginnings. Okay. Because we went to war doesn't mean we lost. Doesn't mean that, you know, what we did was bad. It doesn't mean that we're victims and it doesn't mean that we were assholes or evil. That's what society kind of want to makes us feel sometimes only because they don't want to accept the responsibility of sending us the fuck out there because they were lied to or they feel they were lied to. Or what the fuck ever it is. I don't care. It's like getting mad at a dog for biting the fucking dude that you thought was attacking you. But it ended up being a cop that you didn't recognize because he was undercover. It's a big mistake. But come on. We can't kill Mm -hmm. the dog over that shit because you trained him to do that. And again, I love economics because I know bankers and all these huge politicians actually think the military and veterans are dogs. And I don't mean it in a bad way because I think dogs are some of the greatest fucking people on earth mean that (laughs) i mean that (laughs) when you look at it i don't mind being uh, approached or looked at as a dog or down because i know i'm not and i don't mind looking that people look up because i know i'm not i know I'm, i'm right across the level just like a dog is when they're on all fours you're not really taller than most anybody you could be a chihuahua and get up on your hind feet and be just as tall as well, probably like a basset hound that's you know just regular stand, but you get what my point is. You right. know, you don't have to be the big dog in the fight, you know, and it's the same thing like what we were talking about in the beginning with physical appearances, like with Navy SEALs and uh, all these other people. You don't want to discredit yourself before you try because of the way you look, think, or feel right now. That's not what life is. It, emotions and thoughts are fleeting. We can't just focus our entire self on that. We have to think a little bit big picture, a little bit long-term, like what you were saying. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And, and and again, it comes down to the notion that we have to take control. We have to realize what we can't control. We can't control the weather. We can't control how other people view us. We can't control um, other people's perceptions. We can't control, in a lot of ways, American politics outside of our vote. Um, But what we can control is ourselves. What we can control is what we do in our spare time. What we can control is how we start to view the bad things that happen to us. Do we view them as victims or do we view them as opportunities? Do we view them as opportunities to learn about ourselves 
and to learn lessons about life. Because if you do that, if you know, if you go back to the Stoic philosophers, Epictetus, uh, Seneca, uh, Marcus Aurelius, they all talk about this. If you start to see your problems as part of nature and part of opportunities for you to learn, you'll have a much more fulfilling life. Absolutely. You'll be, be able to see every see the good in everything that happens to you. I have ulcerative colitis, and it has at times made my life miserable, but it is a blessing that I have ulcerative colitis. And it's a blessing because it gives me perspective that I can use to help other people. It's taught me things about my body that if I didn't know, I'd probably be on the path to heart disease and diabetes right now. And so I'm thankful for that disease. I'm thankful for the fact that I was homeless for a while. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm thankful for the fact that I haven't made it yet as far as my businesses go. I'm thankful for that because it's kept me hungry and it's forced me to learn. And I've read hundreds of books because of that and learned so many new things, you know, that is and that's, beautiful. that's how people have to view things. Absolutely. I, I, I tell my kids and I tell my wife, it, the only reason why we have problems is because we need to find solutions. And the great thing about problems is they're only there because there are solutions, not because right. there's no solution. I mean, look at the whole scientific, well, we use science again. We could prove things scientifically now. If E equals MC square was never spoken, never came up, how far along do you think we would be on the destruction of mankind? Because again, we're teetering on nuclear war. People forget that. We're teetering on world war. People forget that because we're arguing over stupid shit like whether or not, um, I guess your color matters. That's, that's probably one of the major conversations or actually because you said the vote, people don't think or believe in their vote anymore. And the numbers prove that because we are animals, we're stupid. We're very simple. I'm an idiot. I accept that we are we're just like rats, okay? And I worked in some really cool shit where I understand that psychology where if you give a rat a sugar cube, he's going to love you regardless of what the fuck it is. You can be a deceptive, uh, uh, what's it called? A corrupt, uh, just absolute selfish, destructive individual. But right now, if you can express yourself, people want to align with that only because you're allowed to express yourself. And that's really what I see in a lot of the political campaigns right now, because certain uh, candidates are stating things like outrageous conclusions or outrageous solutions. People are emotionally charged. Of course they are right now. A lot of shit's going on. But the problem is when you offer an emotional answer, you're going to never, ever, ever solve the problem. If you f have an emotional response like banned all Mexicans, okay, bro, let me... Be honest, like the majority of everything you own is not going to be operated the next day. So I don't know what you're saying. So, or how about all Muslims? And I'm going, bro, uh, I know all Muslims are not fucking bad. There's billions of them. And here's the thing. There's billions of Christians. There's, bi there's billions of people, okay? The problem is, is when one side or sect believes in the opposite. And Muslims, I think, are very beautiful type of existing people that identify with the religion because it's not color it's not uh geographically based just like christianity and a lot of people have that brown person mentality so they're like oh my god he's from india he must be taliban I'm like no dude that, that's like that make no sense he's from india bro He's going to probably bust out some really cool Bollywood moves if he fucking be cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's the truth. Like, people forget because they're wrapped up not only in themselves, but in the things they're worried about. And that's not good. You know, the Bible says it. Do not worry. Not because it's not worth worrying, but because worry does not add a single thing. Not a day to your life. Not a dollar to your account. Worrying doesn't do shit. And the dude that runs Alibaba, if everybody was like, oh, well, you're not a billionaire. I don't go to listen. The dude from Alibaba says it. The only thing that matters is what you do, not what you think you can do, not what you think can happen, but what you do. And that's it. Right. Instead of waking up in the morning and saying, I think I can, I think. Just get up in the morning, put on some fucking tubes and start doing shit. It doesn't matter what yeah. you're doing. Start sweeping. Cool. Start vacuuming. Cool. Start exercising. Great. Start writing mm -hmm. your movie. Start writing a book. I think people need to do that more. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the thing is, um, and just, just to kind of wrap it up here, when we think about politics, there, there are so many people 
in our community who who identify with being a conservative. And I, I also identify with being a conservative. And the reason why I identify with it is not because I hate a particular group. It's not because I feel like the country is insecure. It's not because I'm worried about Mexicans crossing the border. The reason I am a conservative is because I believe in the power of self-help, right? Let me say that again. The reason why I am a conservative is because I believe in the power of self-help. And that's the basis, the basic philosophy of conservatism, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, it's at the, the root of it. At the root of it. Mm -hmm. So many people forget that because they're worried about everything else outside of their own realm. But everything we've been talking about today, you know, the idea of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, the idea of not waiting for some government entity to tell you that you have something or to okay you, um, say you're okay to be in this program. The idea that you are the only person that can help you have a better life through hard work and through discipline, that is the basis of conservatism. And that's why I identify with that. If more people were more congruent in our community with their personal lives, between their personal lives and their political philosophies, I think that we would have a much more productive and a uh, much happier community. I, I, you, dude, you nailed it. Much more productive and happier is absolutely what I feel like when we talk about this stuff. And that that's something that I think is is not just – a gorgeous experience, but a profound thing to pass on to anybody that can listen to this. But on another note, let's go ahead and get all your websites. Let's get your about your blog and and any kind of con, uh, contact information that we can get out for you. Yeah, man. Um, so you can hit me up anytime. Uh, well, my website is www.warriorsoulfitness.com. That's www.warriorsoulfitness.com. We're a clothing company um, made by Marines. Um, all, all the everybody in my manufacturing uh, company that I work with is uh, Marines. And um, uh, on the on the website, you'll be able to find all my content, my blogs, my videos, uh, Warrior Soul TV. You'll be able to find some pretty motivational gear. Um, but that's not the real point of it. The point of it is, I want you to check out the content. I want you to. Let me know if any of it's helped you out. Um, my big goal here is to help other veterans to live their best lives um, and to get them to a point where they're in a flow state of happiness, where they're congruent with their values and where they're able to accomplish things that they never thought they could. Dude, that is wonderful. And I feel really honestly just absolutely blessed that we met and uh, that I'm, I'm moving along with the whole, you know, online training, but also that the type of content we got today, I think people are going to be not only moved, but absolutely going like, dude, that was fucking awesome. I can't wait to go fuck myself up in a gym now. You know, you know what I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly absolutely, miss man. the shit out of it because people used to look at me and go, what in the fuck is wrong with you? Because... How do you? How are you lifting fifty, uh, forty to fifty thousand pounds in a night in volume? And I'm like, well, in, in an hour and a half to two hours, that's my goal. That's I don't want to sit around and fucking toy around. I don't want to be here all day. I want to go in there, tear shit up, feel the fucking expression, feel that gorging blood pump flow, and just fucking get after it. I don't know why. That's just what I learned. You know, that's my lifestyle. That's what I like to do. Exactly. But when people started seeing that guy in his development, like how big I was and how developed I was, how strong I was, they negatively perceived it instead of saying, oh, he's busting his ass for this. You know, and that's, and that's something we really have to, I think, keep in mind is we don't understand or know what everybody else is facing at times. And what your point is, as far as humility, we can't learn as much as we could without being humble or trying to show humility. Yeah. All right then, bro. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and wrap it completely up. Um, we're going to thank be you so much for up. having me on here today, Joey. This has been awesome. Oh, uh, no problem, dude. Fucking we'll be doing this like well, often because like, like I said, I really, I love the program that you got developed. I love the energy. I love the resources because 
we can do so much with it because when I sit back and think, I don't sit back and think, how do I create everything from my ideas? I look at what's out there and go, man, these dudes have a lot of what I think I want to be doing. So how can I get more involved in that? I don't have to go out and build my whole new t-shirt company or whatever in order to get involved in other people's t-shirt companies that I enjoy. Like my one of my good buddies, Chris Renfro, okay? He's doing a shit ton of work, great work for the Chive uh, and their fundraising foundations in Texas. If he didn't believe he could be accepted or go to those things and express himself openly, I'm telling you right now, it would never be happening. That's the type of stuff that he provides for himself to get out and handle his shit because he believes in something bigger and he knows that it's worth working hard for. Absolutely, man. And that's what it's about. 